like to thank uh, TED SMU organizers for allowing me to speak to you for a few minutes about something that's important to me and something that I hope is going to be important to you, and that's engineering and, and humanity. Specifically, how can engineers and those outside the field of engineering build a better world? Throughout history, engineers have made remarkable, provided remarkable solutions to some of uh, the most daunting human challenges. In fact, most of modern society has been influenced or affected positively by engineering. Yet specifically, despite these successes, many problems of the global poor and disadvantaged communities around the world still have yet to benefit from the creativity of engineers and scientists. Over 40% of the world's population lives on less than $2 a day. One billion people lack access to safe drinking water, and two billion lack access to proper sanitation or modern energy sources. It's estimated that 100 million people are homeless in the world, and about 1.1 billion have substandard housing. Even in the United States, it's been estimated that the poverty, the number of people in poverty has risen by 6 million people since the year 2000. What will change everything? Engineers and those outside the field of engineering focusing their creative energies on addressing the issue of global poverty. First slide. We could focus on issues of water quality, such as on the slide here, this was a picture taken a few years ago in Haiti, uh, when we were working with some students on trying to address water quality issues, and that, that mud, mud puddle you see there was the drinking water source for this community. We're looking at the substandard housing problem in Tijuana, Mexico, a city and a country devastated by gang wars associated with human and drug trafficking. Or if we go to Ethiopia, the issue of water availability a severe challenge due to the droughts that have plagued that country and that part of the world. One of the challenges there is just transporting the water from the local river source to the village. Even when they can drill wells, or dig wells, I should say, the period of e the effort takes so long that often it doesn't solve the problems for the villages in time, as demonstrated on this slide, which is a funeral of a five-year-old who died from the drought. And this was the fourth of fourth child died of a family of six from the drought due to lack of water. What we need is innovative technologies that can provide solutions that directly focus on and alleviate, alleviate the hardships of the global poor. Some of that's been done throughout the world. We're seeing some success. Here's an example of some efforts in Nicaragua where there was an early warning system put in to protect from hurricanes. And you can see a picture of a rain gauge uh, that the child is embracing there that provided warning for that village. The other examples could include in northern Peru, an area of the world devastated by multiple earthquakes, to redesign housing that can be resistant to earthquakes and provide better survivability, if you will, to those that have to experience that type of event. We're looking, how can we construct low-cost, high-strength, recyclable housing, as demonstrated here in 2009 in South Africa, to improve the issue of substandard housing. What I'd like to suggest is, although those are successes that we've had in engineering recently, it's not enough. Frequently, engineers, when we address problems, we tend to focus on a deliverable. Matter of fact, we pride ourselves as engineers as we get things done. We do produce deliverables, but often those deliverables are in a vacuum. We need a holistic approach to engineering. We need to train a new generation of engineers to work with those outside of engineering. In essence, we need balance, as demonstrated in the photograph behind me. What I'd like to share with you for about seven and a half minutes is the experience that I had over the last year where I was the provincial engineer for Baghdad, an opportunity that was given to me by Secretary Gates, one that I'm very grateful for. My responsibility was really twofold. One was to counter the IED effort, that is, find and neutralize all the explosives and bombs in Baghdad so we could have 
safe passage, if you will, for the people of Baghdad, whether they be Iraqis or coalition forces or Iraqi security forces. But the second is the provincial engineer is to rebuild Baghdad. And so what I'm going to talk to you about for a few minutes is to demonstrate a holistic approach to engineering that we implemented in Sadr City, which was a suburb of about three and a half million people in Baghdad. Baghdad's about eight and a half million, so Chicago's about 10 million, so that gives you a kind of a, a frame of reference. And what you can see in the background here is the Tigris River, which is the drinking water supply, if you will, for the city of Baghdad and the area around Iraq. Now, as the provincial engineer, my first responsibility was to assess the engineering in Baghdad. What is the state of the municipal facilities? Because I'm only going to talk about the rebuilding of Baghdad. I'm not going to focus on the counter IED explosives mission. That's a different talk for a different day. Well, if you're the engineer of a city, Dallas, Chicago, Baghdad, the first thing you do is you assess the status of the municipal facilities, the essential services being offered to your citizens. And then you would target your effort to those services that basically were in the most need of desperate repair. Well, Baghdad had municipal facilities, about 363, that had not been properly maintained, properly designed, and of course they, many of them had been destroyed through the initial efforts of the war that was ongoing throughout the country. Sadr City, a suburb of Baghdad, was considered the most desperate and violent place in Iraq. So dangerous that Saddam Hussein himself would not go into Sadr City even with his Republican Guard. It was that disadvantaged community. It was a community for decade upon decade that had been disadvantaged in terms of no support from the government, and it was in essence where all the criminals and a lot of the outcasts from the Iraqi society would migrate. It also was the center for the militia. And so the idea that I had, and am grateful to General Hammond, General Austin of the 18th Airborne Corps, and General Petraeus, was to try a different fo focus of engineering. To use engineering producing deliverables, but doing that in a way where we integrated into the culture of Sadr City in this case, and change the community from the grassroots up to the national government. And by doing so, giving them confidence in their government and giving them confidence in themselves and the ability for their country to, to produce success. So if we'll go back to the slide, the way that we did that is using an assessment called SWEAT H, sewage, water, electricity, academics, i.e. school buildings, and health. And so what you see behind me here is a picture of some sewage problems that we had in Sadr City. This right here is three and a half feet of standing sewage in the vegetable market that was the primary economic center for the city. That had a dampering effect. It was there for about four years. And uh, this is uh, just sewage standing in the, in the uh, local water sources, trash, all kinds of problems. 600,000 cubic meters of sewage a day were discharged untreated into the Tigris River, if you could imagine that. Moving from sewage, to water, as I mentioned, water provided the drinking water for the community, so what we had was we had water pump stations that had been damaged or destroyed by the militia, because if you're militia and you want to convince the locals from having trust and confidence in the government, what better way to do is to deny them essential services. And so they did an effective job at that, so we went in and we rebuilt and revitalized all of the pump stations, both irrigation and, wa and source water, and also repaired all those sewage issues in the previous slide. Electricity, huge problem in power generation and distribution throughout Iraq, but especially in Baghdad. So what we did initially was provided micro generations and grow small co-op businesses, put solar lights in, this is in Sadr City, and soon an area that was completely dark at night is now lit up, providing security and sustainability, also a source of pride for the community. Academics rebuilt every school in Sadr City in 90 days, every one. Can't tell you the impact that had on the young people. Moving into trash, trash is a real issue because if you're hiding IEDs, a great place to hide IEDs is in the trash, and when a building would be blown up through, a, through an indirect fire or an artillery attack, it became of dumping ground for trash, not only a health problem, but also a place to hide future bombs. We are able to clean this up working with local government and even implement a recycling program in Sadr City of all places. There's a proud uh, 
a proud gentleman with his recycling can. Health clinics rebuilt every health clinic and every hospital in Sauter City. My goal was to make Sauter City, which was infested with the militia and considered the center of gravity for our fight in Baghdad and Iraq, to make it the most desirable place in Iraq. But to not do it through American effort, to do it through Iraqi effort, to create conditions of hope by growing Iraqi businesses where they would hire the 16 to 30 year old male who was placing the IEDs out for the militia and to train them and to work with the local government to the national government to include Prime Minister Maliki's cabinet all through engineering. The end result was, I think that's my last slide, the end result was we saw attacks go from 200 a day to zero attacks on the day of provincial elections. We saw streets in Sauter City that you couldn't physically walk down because of all the rubble from the war and sniper attacks to being so crowded because of bustling businesses you could not walk down because of all the traffic associated with growing businesses. To this day, Sauter City is thriving and Iraq has record low occurrences of violence. Unfortunately, most of the violence that still occurs is Iraqi on Iraqi violence, particularly from those militia that are still trying to destabilize the government. Now, what does that have to do with global poverty? Well, in my last few seconds, what I'd like to propose to you, if we could use engineering, working with the users community, working with the locals, understanding engineering and the culture of the environment by which we're trying to design and build, and we can change Sadr City, and we can change Baghdad, and we can change Iraq, why can't engineers working with people outside of the field of engineering focus head on the issue of global poverty? I believe we can, and I think if we will, it will change everything. Thank you.